Hello and welcome to this Australian Biocommons webinar on genomic data improving discovery and access management. My name is Melissa Burke. I'm the Australian Biocommons Training and Communications Officer and I will be your host for this webinar. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we are joining you from today. Today, we are joining you from the lands of the Ngunnawal, Wurundjeri, Gadigal, Bidigal and Gundagara peoples. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country, and we recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. At the Australian Biocommons, we are building digital capability for life science research with the goal of ensuring that Australian researchers remain globally competitive. And we're doing this by providing better access to the tools, methods and training that you need. Human genomics is one of the areas that we're focusing on. And today we're thrilled to welcome four members of our Human Genomes Platform Project to the webinar. Joining us today are Jess Holliday, Program Manager for the Human Genome Informatics at Australian Biocommons, Dr. Andrew Patterson, the Human Genomics Data Technology Lead at the University of Melbourne, Mustafa Syed, the Bioinformatics System Integration Manager at the Children's Cancer Institute, and Associate Professor Sarah Kummerfeld, Director, Data Science at the Garvin Institute of Medical Research. Welcome to the webinar, Jess, Andrew, Mustafa, and Sarah. And I'm now going to hand you over to Jess to get us started. Thanks again, everyone. It's great to be able to present to you today, along with my colleagues, Andrew, Mustafa, and Sarah. As Melissa mentioned, my name's Jess Holliday, and I sit within the Human Genome Informatics team at the Australian Biocommons. And within the Human Genome Informatics team, we have a portfolio of projects uh, focused on improving human genomics research infrastructure in Australia. And one of those projects, and in fact, the biggest project within that portfolio is the Human Genomes Platform Project or the HGPP for short. And the work that we'll be presenting today in this webinar forms part of the HGPP. So I'm gonna start with some context setting and then give you a broad overview of the HGPP before handing over to my colleagues. In Australia, we're generating a large amount of human genomics data, and that's an increasing trend, but we don't currently have a national strategy or a coordinated approach or solution for how these data are, are stored, managed, queried, and shared in a responsible and secure fashion. And so what inevitably ends up happening is that research uh, institutes will uh, hold on to those uh, data sets and effectively lock them up and isolate them within silos. And the consequences of, of this um, are that we're unable to derive the full value from these really critical data assets through integration and reanalysis. Some data does get sent to the European Genome Phenome Archive or the EGA for short, and that's a service for permanent archiving and sharing uh, of personally identifiable genotypic, phenotypic, and clinical data, but the submission and access process to the EGA is, is challenging for a number of reasons. So recognizing that current state and the challenges that exist, and, and also obviously the opportunities that exist, the Human Genome Informatics Initiative was, was born within the Australian Biocommons, and we have a mission to engage with the, the Australian Research Committee, uh, sorry, Research Community, uh, and, and enable the fair and equitable access to human genomics research data through the provision of national scale digital infrastructure. So moving on to the HGPP now, it is a large collaborative uh, project with those challenges that I highlighted earlier in mind. And it brings together leading genomics research organizations and infrastructure providers around the country to investigate and implement global standards and technologies to Australia and improve the overall state of human genomics data sharing. It's jointly funded by the Australian Research Data Commons, Bioplatforms Australia and contributions from all of our partner organizations. 
It started in uh, early 2021 and goes until the end of this year. And ultimately what we want to deliver is a services toolbox based on emerging global standards. There are five work packages or sub-projects as we call them that, that encompass the projects shown here. So virtual cohorts, the first one is uh, what we define as the ability to discover multiple data sets across multiple data sources that match a researcher's criteria of interest. DAC automation is uh, investigating and implementing tools to help automate and streamline the data access process for both the data requester and the data custodians. Federated identity and access management uh, is looking at how we can ensure researchers can securely access human genomics resources across Australia with their trusted institutional identity. Data and metadata archiving is looking at ways to facilitate the process of long-term archiving of Australian human genomics research data. Um, and it, we're also exploring the feasibility of setting up a federated node of the EGA. Communications, documentation and training wraps everything up and ensures that users are able to use the solutions that we're implementing effectively. And on the right-hand side, we've got all of our uh, partners that are engaged in the project, uh, including universities, research, institute, uh, research institutes and computational infrastructure partners. So what's in our toolbox and where are we at? Um, each, each of our sub-projects are currently in a pilot implementation phase where we have selected uh, a preferred technology and we're testing it out. Uh, against our user requirements that we gathered during the preceding knowledge discovery phase. And throughout all of our endeavours, we've tried to follow the principles of open source, global standards, uh, building on what is out there rather than building new things and documenting all of our experiences along the way. So far, we have published knowledge discovery reports to Zenodo and GitHub. We've delivered posters and oral presentations at national and international events. We've generated documentation and published on the web. We've established pilot implementations of key software uh, and built relationships between major human genomics research institutes and connected to international initiatives such as Elixir, GA4GH, EGA and CR Logon. And most importantly, we've built these foundational partnerships and, and mapped a future direction for subsequent projects and initiatives in this space. So I'll now hand over to my colleagues, Andrew, Mustafa and Sarah. They'll tell us a bit more about these three sub-projects, including demonstrating some of the software that we've selected in the project uh, and that we're currently testing in our pilot implementation phase, as I said. So over to Pado, who will tell us more about community management functionality of CR Logon and how that has enabled identity management in the HGPP. Thank you, Jess. Um, unfortunately for identity management, it's pretty boring. There's just logins and stuff. So there's no really cool demos. Mustafa is going to get to do the best, the best demo, but uh, I'll talk you through uh, what we're doing in the identity management stream. Um, so identity management is a, is a key infrastructure plank in any federated or distributed system. So the minute we're starting to talk about cross-institute, um, you really got to have this kind of glue that allows uh, identity to be strongly asserted between the, the distributed uh, federated uh, nodes. Um, luckily for us, there is a, a, a very broadly agreed upon base technology set that achieves this, and these are all non-genomic non and, and these are just general technology set. So that's um, OpenID Connect or OIDC, uh, OR, SAML, and then there is some very genomic specific work being done by the GA4JH called Passports and Visas that, that lives on top of that. Um, next slide, thanks. Um, so that sounds all very abstract, but TLDR, what does it all mean? It really means that uh, the users can use their own institute credentials to log in to collaborative, to distributed, federated websites. So in our particular context, that means um, the, our own, what we call our, our host institutes, our educational institutes, our research institute, 
our logins from from University of Melbourne or University of Queensland or CSIRO and use those not just to log into University of Melbourne systems, but to be able to log into collaborative systems um, that are going to underpin all this data sharing. So exactly the same technology as you use in regular world where someone where it comes up and says you can log in with your Gmail or log in with your GitHub, absolutely exactly the same technology. But for us, uh, enabled by the AAF, the Australian Access Federation, uh, across all Australian universities and increasingly uh, most of the research institutes. Uh, and importantly, um, the user has an identity, an identifier that is, is common across the entire network. And so that's why two different systems in different states can know they're talking about the same Andrew Patterson um, because there is a consistent process by which I prove that I am logged in via my host and there is a consistent identifier that both both uh, nodes can talk about. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so in practice, what were the goals of our stream in HTTP? Well, it was it was mainly to be a glue for the other streams to to help enable them in whatever in whatever way they wanted. Um, to demonstrate some of this technology in practice, to demonstrate AAF uh, and other technologies, to investigate gaps and recommend solutions, and then to pilot some solutions to uh, to kick the tires on 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 things. Uh, next slide. So uh, we did a reasonably extensive requirements analysis and we examined um, some of the solutions that were out there. Uh, the, the main gap identified, uh, you know, considering that logins are working across the world and everyone can do a, a, a GitHub login and a, a Google login. So that base technology is out there and works. What is missing? And, and the number one thing that came up as the main gap is, is community management. And that's the ability for groups of users to be able to self-organize into communities and use those groups to control rights. So that's kind of saying, look, we, we want to enable a service. We want to allow anyone, we want to allow University of Melbourne and University of Queensland to be involved. We don't want the whole of the University of Melbourne to be involved in our particular community over here. We want to gate the community in some way. So we want to be able to pick arbitrary people from any institute across Australia but we wanted to be able to say group them and say, well, these are the admins and these are the members and have a build a community uh, at some level above the uh, above the base logins. So after a scan of some of the products that are out there, we uh, chose CI Logon, which is a uh, technology stack from the University of Illinois uh, Center for Supercomputing. So they use a lot in uh, physics, um, astronomy research in the US, but uh, we've chosen it here to deploy in Australia. Uh, next slide. So just as a, where does this all fit in? We'll start at the bottom of the diagram. So at the bottom are the, what we call the identity providers. And that is literally the login screen that you get presented when you try to log into the University of Melbourne or the login screen you get for CSIRO or University of Sydney or Monash. So we call those the IDPs, the identity providers. Um, we then have an aggregator, that's the AAF, the Australian Access, they are a service that makes sure all of those identity providers stay up and are connected and have a common set of policies across all of them. So that's the work that AAF does. We then add CI login as an aggregator, and then above it, the product that helps us manage communities, and that's called co-manage. And then on top of co-manage are applications. What do we mean by applications? Applications are web portals, um, you know, Confluence and Jira sites, anything that involves a login and an identity, data sharing, endpoints, all of those things are the apps that then can live on top of, of co-manage. Uh, next slide. So these are just a couple of screenshots. You're not going to get much value from them, but just to, to show you what co-manage does. So co-manage obviously has the concepts of people and populations and groups, and it's a manager that people can log into. I can be dedicated as an administrator of my subunit. I can list the people who are in my subunit here. I've listed myself as three, three different people. Now if we go to the next slide, um, we can set up groups. Here I'm setting up a group called the HGPP Researcher by Organization. The grouping mechanisms of co-manage are really quite powerful. You can individually select people into a group. 
but you can also nest groups and have exclusion. So you can say people are in this group as long as they're not in this other group, or you can say, I want to collate all the people from the other groups and bring them into a, a common group. So here we've listed as a nested group, all the people who are from the Zero Childhood Cancer and all the people from the University of Melbourne Centre for Cancer Research. And so if we go to the next slide, we'll see that um, when we look at who is in this group now, uh, that gets derived automatically. I could be manually put into this group or I am also in this group because I've, I've derived from my membership of another group. So there's some of the fancy kind of group membership and there's lots of role-based access control that can be set up. And this is going to allow particular communities, i.e. the genomic community or subsets of the genomic community to control uh, assertions and, and who's, who's allowed to do what in, in these distributed systems. Uh, next slide. So what in particular did we do in practice? So we did one really, really boring thing, which was we made logins work with an application. So this is very, very standard. We could have done this with any app. We did it with, with an app that I'm working on called Elsa. Uh, and we use CI login just as a gateway into that application. So my application Elsa that I'm writing has no table of users or passwords. I don't have to do any login mechanisms myself. There's no forms within Elsa for you to log in. There's just a button that button bounces us through a standard process that bounces people, they pick their host institute, they log in at their host institute and it comes back to Elsa and you have to be in a special group in, in co-manage in order for that to work. Uh, so that's not particularly rocket science-y, but is a, is a good example of what, what can be done quite easily. Uh, so the grouping here was just a, a, an enabler to allow us to log in. Uh, so next slide. Uh, but there are more complex things that we would want to do. And so uh, I'm not going to go into details here, but people can follow up afterwards if they want some of the nitty gritty of JWTs and Java tokens and th uh, web tokens, et cetera. Um, but what we wanted to do was across the beacon network that Mustafa is going to talk to us about, we wanted to establish the concept of a bona fide researcher. So that is someone that the human genomics community has agreed, has reached a level of training and or courses or uh, trust that they are uh, considered a, a, a worthy researcher. But the trick here is we want that claim, that grouping to be able to apply across a wider distributed system. So what we've done is we've uh, established that group within, within, CI, in, within CI Logon on co-manage, and we do some work with tokens and assertions and claims to allow a token to be created that can be sent downstream to all the beacon nodes. And when those beacon nodes get that token, they can go, ah, yes, the person who has presented this to me is definitely someone who is trusted and it can enable uh, more functionality. So it's a slightly more complex uh, version of just a plain login. So I will hand over to Mustafa, who's going to demonstrate the whole gamut of what beacon can do. And underlying that, you'll see some of the login stuff. Thank you. So uh, I would like to begin with uh, with this goal. So as Jess mentioned, uh, the goal is to <laughs> enhance the capability for securely and responsibly sharing human genomics research data nationally. So when it comes to clinical genomics data, data is in short supply. The more data we have, the more informed our methods can be and more research it can facilitate. Currently, there is no way to identify uh, cohorts of individuals who had their genome sequenced nationally. And it is not possible to query across the separate assets from each uh, participating genomic repository. So in this project, we have uh, partner institutes, UMC, UMCCR, uh, QIM, RB, CCIA, Garvin, and NCI, who is working to build this platform for data sharing. So. So what's the concept? The concept or the goal here is a user, like a researcher, clinician, uh, use an interface that enables a national search across participating genomic repositories by relevant uh, demographics and clinically related metadata elements and return, return that information to the user. So user would like to know uh, what uh, data is stored uh, and where the data is housed. So the main components for building a data sharing platform, as uh, just mentioned, are 
a user interface to browse all this data catalog, some method to request uh, data access, uh, uh, and uh, some, some place to save all your big data, and wrap all these apps with seamless authentication and authorization method. And I'm going to take you mostly through the first one, the user interface uh, to browse data catalog, uh, which is the virtual cohort part of this project. So uh, in the discovery phase of this project, uh, we have gathered requirements from key stakeholders. We have identified a set of problems that need to be addressed, the current state of institutional human genomics data querying in Australia, the current state of processes and tools for virtual cohort querying, uh, rec some recommendations on preferred technologies and proposed uh, implementation architecture, and uh, finally, some candidate solutions to enable cross-institutional virtual cohort querying. So currently, there is no centralized repository, and to make a genomic data easily, easily discoverable, metadata from different providers has to be made uh, uh, has to be harmonized made searchable and shareable so also the data and metadata must be restricted to the level of access for which the user is authorized so some technical requirements that came out of discovery phase was all the partner institutes, first of all, express the desire to share their data with each other and be able to query each other's data at cohort level, patient level, or the phenotypic level. It is an essential precondition for searchable and shareable data from federated sources to have these properties. Like, first of all, we need a common data description or ontology to annotate data from different sources. We need a minimum common data model. Uh, and we need implementation of distributed search query protocol or framework. We need a user interface to browse and search data. We need a user interface to request access and download data. Then, then the integration with other apps, uh, project partners uh, uh, agreed that the discovery or query service should interface with federated IM, which Pato was just uh, mentioning, uh, just talking about to provide appropriate access to control data. Integration with DAC, which is the next part of this talk, which is another sub-project of HGPP for data request handoff. So it is essential that whatever ex existing technologies we agree upon be fit for a purpose and flexible enough to handle any kind of extensions and modifications to suit the diverse requirements of project partners. So we then began to collect user stories from all, all partner institutions. And from these user stories, we can derive the common criteria required by project partners to assemble virtual cohort of interest. Uh, and it should, it should have a data model which include uh, data types, whether the data is sequencing or RNA-seq, whole genome sequencing data, whether it's a primary or secondary uh, data, sample types, whether it's a blood, fresh frozen tumor biopsy, and nail or uh, some other type of sample. We need uh, phenotypes such as uh, cancer diagnosis or, uh, or a patient genetic disorder. We need mutation data, SNVs, indels, gene fusions. We need uh, data on data, uh, on access, uh, such as like consent, data location, data, uh, data use requirements. We need clinical metadata, such as survival time, age, follow-up disease status, and we need a cohort of a cohort level data, such as patient, the number of patients of a certain type. So, uh, so there was uh, some candidate solution that came out of initial discovery phase are listed here. So I uh, I won't go into details of each of these technolo uh, technologies, but briefly want to tell like Gecko is from Seneca and this project uh, harmonize, uh, harmonization methodology was used to categorize variables and find overlap between models. And then we have the Data Connect API developed uh, within the G GA4GH. 
It can essentially work with any data that can be transformed into array of JSON object. It can either define or assume any particular data model. We have Pheno packets, a GA4GHS standard that describes all aspects of clinical metadata to enable a standardized and quite deep phenotyping, about like 55 classes, seven uh, that is split across seven uh, class categories. Uh, Gen3, which is one quite important solution uh, because it can handle authentication, authorization, uh, manage permissions, and access to project at group or individual level. It is a quite comprehensive solution, including DAC tools, uh, but it is tightly coupled, and uh, it has all those tightly coupled microservices, and you cannot query across multiple instances. It's quite restricted to AWS and requires uh, custom engineering for other cloud, pla cloud platforms. Uh, and finally, we have the Beacon version 2 data model and framework, which provides a default data model and API specifications, uh, which we will cover in more detail here. So the virtual cohort team investigated all, all those data models and agreed that the Beacon version two model fits for minimal data metadata harmonization needs and for the purpose of proof of concept. So Beacon is quite lightweight service. Uh, Beacon instances comprises, com, uh, composes, compose of two main parts. Uh, the framework, which defines the rules and structure around setting up APIs and perform beacon queries. So you have a request structure, you have a response structure. Beacon version two framework is however explicitly designed to be data model agnostic and extension to a model does not require major changes in the framework. Then we have the data model. Uh, as you can see here, the uh, quick summary of the beacon v2 default model comprises of seven base entities, including collections, cohort, data sets, variations, genomic variations, individuals, biosamples, and analysis. And within these entities, it reuses existing ontologies and GA4GH specifications. It can be a standalone web service hosting metadata in a, in a database like Mongo, MongoDB. So some of the challenges and pros and cons of this uh, this technology is first of all it's it allows querying uh, 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 and discovering data across multiple data sources without compromising uh, confidential data and I, as i said before it's lightweight it has loosely coupled services it's a it is a ga4gh standard it it uh, it is quite it has it can uh, it is flexible implement it has flexible implementation options it supports aggregated query through a beacon network. The data model is adaptable and extensible and supports sharing of SNVs in Dell variant natively with extension to support copy number variants. But on the other hand, beacon comes with no native data access request tool. It comes with no native authentication layer, access control, at the level of project rather than individuals. And the Beacon Network has quite rudimentary basic UI, and it does not support uh, direct access to genomic data files. And it has highly nested uh, schema structure. On the data access, there are three types of data access uh, you can provide with the Beacon. First one, a public public data access, which is open to everyone with or without account. Second one is, regist, uh, is for the registered users. And third one is for the highly sensitive data set for which you like to give access only to a subset of registered users, not all registered users. You can see like there is a placeholder in the API uh, uh, for the type of data access. And with these, three type of uh, different type of data access beacon is quite flexible on one end and secure on the other end. So you have you have option to share data with everyone, with registered users or with a small group of registered users. 
So you won't lose the ownership of the data. You have the full control on the data access. Also, the beacon could return response at different gran gran granularity levels. So it can return either a Boolean response, whether the data exists or not. It can return a count, a uh, number of matching re uh, records, just the count. And the third type of response is the result set for every collection, basically every record that matches the query will be returned, the complete record. Uh, now here uh, you can see the architecture diagram. Each partner site hosts a lightweight beacon backed by data from their data store. So creation of ETL process and mapping from internal to shared data model is the work unit required from each site. Uh, and uh, now there are two versions of beacon. Version one, which is uh, uh, more focused on variants only. So you can make a query like present or absence of a mutation on a federated network of beacons. Whereas version two, which includes genotype, phenotype, clinical metadata about samples and patients. So you can make a lot more powerful queries involving not just genotypic data, but also phenoty phenotypic data and clinical metadata, uh, including like gender, age, disease, sample type, type of sequencing. Basically, you can make more real world queries with using Beacon V2. So we, we are here focused on this Beacon version two. You can query the, these beacons individually using Beacon API, or you can query collectively uh, a bunch of beacons using a beacon network. Beacon themselves are effective, but they are, more, uh, they are made significantly more effective uh, uh, with the introduction of beacon network. To build a beacon network, you need to run three microservices. First one is a database microservice, which is a Postgres database that saves details on all registered beacons. Second is a registry microservice to register beacon and keep track of different beacons that are participating in the beacon network. And then the third one, which is the more interesting one, which, which is like the brain of the network. It sends out the query to all beacons in the network, gather the data back and aggregates the results from the queries into a single response object. Uh, so all this is exposed using Beacon UI. Most existing Beacon UIs aggregate data from Beacon version one, which is the variant only data. Uh, there is quite basic rudimentary uh, UI available from Beacon network team for Beacon version two. So there is a need for user interface that allows users to put queries you want to send to the network and then list and then return the list of results from all the beacons in the network. So we worked on this new user interface, which is quite user-friendly and uh, secure, seamlessly aggregate data from all the beacons in the network. So uh, let me now show you that interface. So, so this interface basically has three main components a dashboard showing you the count of main entities, which you are seeing here. A filter component, which, which I will show you shortly, is a, where you can refine your queries and find a specific set of individual or build a virtual cohort of individual. And then the result panel, which, uh, which shows some charts and tabular views. So first of all, this is the landing page. This page shows you overview, some stats from all the beacons in the network, a user can log in with CI logon or even browse uh, browse data without login. You will uh, I will show you some differences in views when you uh, when you browse without login or when you create a uh, account and register and log in uh, to this uh, interface. Also, we have option here to uh, 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 to register a beacon. We will build a we are planning to build an interface where a collaborator with proper authentication and authorization can register a beacon on the beacon network. So let's see the query interface. So when, on, uh, when you click on explore on the top here, there is a add filter option. 
So this interface will let you add filters and refine results. We have began with a couple of uh, uh, couple uh, uh, couple of highly used entities based on the use cases we got at the requirement phase. We will continue to add more entities and fields after properly testing backend API endpoint connecting to to these properties. So uh, as you can see here, you can select uh, uh, one or more entity and fields and then select the values for, for those. You can add more fields. You can, you can add or remove here. If you don't want to uh, add that, you can simply click this and it will be removed. And then you apply that filter. So first thing you will immediately notice the count of the number of re records, uh, which is updated after filter is applied. So this, this will be further worked on to display count by each beacon in the network. We have, uh, we have two tabs here, as you can see, one, uh, uh, one showing charts. So a pie chart and a histogram, a pie chart shows you disease distribution in the cohort. So if you mouse over, you can, uh, you can see even exact count. On the histogram, uh, we have two colored bars for each disease. Uh, two colors represent uh, gender, number of males and females for each group of disease. On the tabular view, uh, you can you can select uh, properties from individual. So you you are seeing here list of all the properties from the individuals, uh, and uh, you can sort on each of these columns, and it's all paginated. And you can uh, change the view and see number of records. And one one thing I, that I want to show, add is like if I log out, and so I'm not logged into this interface. I'm just clicking on the explore. So you will see the all the the chart view with with just the counts for all those disease categories. But if you go to the tabular view, uh, the that data is conditionally rendered, so you you don't see all the complete details of each individual. So that requires, uh, so it's kind of like controlled access to the, to the data. So what we are seeing here is how user can define a set, subset of individuals obtained by applying set of filtering criteria. And this is what we define as a virtual cohort. So, so this set of basically N individuals or basically uh, uh, the individuals is 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 the virtual cohort so virtual cohort can come from one or more data sets it can come from uh, one or more uh, uh, beacon so now this is the group of individuals that you are interested in uh, and this is the data that you like to download harmonize and analyze further to obtain data we need the tools for uh, to request access and the next part of this talk is going to take you through one such tool rems so I will pass on to uh, Sarah from here. Thanks, Mustafa. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the Data Access Committee or Automation subproject. Um, so this diagram again just shows you all of the components we've been talking about. Um, we're now going to focus here on a Data Access Committee approval. And, and just to be clear, so the, the goal for this, um, this piece is to support the committee and support the management process for when people want to request data access. So what does it look now? Look like now? Um, right now it's a bit like this. There's, or at least before this project started, there's a lot of email flying around. And the way, you know, data access committees have existed for a long time because we did have to have a mechanism for granting access. But we haven't in the Australian landscape generally had tools to make the process of managing a committee smooth. Instead, there was a lot of email back and forth and a lot of uh, requests for more information and sending files back and forth. Um, 
And so, you know, we we wanted to say, well, let how can we improve that um, and make it not only more efficient for the committee and the people requesting access, but also give us a paper trail, an audit trail, and to be able to very easily understand who has access and when they were granted it and have all of the documentation. But to get to that, this, this is where we had our question mark, um, is what is the right tool? We didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So this project um, aimed to tackle that. And to do that, we went through a, a rigorous process, starting off by compiling user stories. And so we brought together people from across the Human Genome Platform project to put in their, um, their requirements and, so, and give us examples of the sorts of things that they need. And when we think about users in this context, they can be a person requesting access, that's one type of user. They could be the data access committee themselves, the people who have to make a decision about approving, but they can also be people like um, data custodians or managers who are the ones that actually have to go through the process of connecting the requester and the committee. Um, and there are others, but you can see the landscape gets pretty complicated pretty quickly. Um, and so this process of building up user stories was, was quite intensive and, and we've come up with um, a lot of different requirements and then test scenarios from those, which then let us um, do an evaluation of tools out there. And the two tools that we focused on were REMS um, and Duos. And so today I'm gonna focus on REMS. The analysis of Duos led us to decide that it wasn't a fit uh, for our ecosystem. It's very, very useful and, and works really well, specifically within the Broad and Terra ecosystem, but we felt that it was a little bit difficult to pull out and use in, in our context where we have people with many different requirements. And so that's why we, we stuck to REMS after some initial analysis of Duos. Um, and so the next stage was to actually get it installed. There was actually already a production REMS instance at the Garvin um, that had been running for a small number of cohorts for a little while. Uh, but as part of this project, uh, Andrew set up a test instance at UMCCR, which was really helpful for us to dig in to the weeds and really understand how it works and, and whether it's a fit for our requirements. We did a detailed business analysis of REMS and went back and forth with the team in Finland to talk to them about adding features. Um, and you know, just mention one here, but I think something that was really important to us is that whatever system we uh, identified and as, as a fit would need to be extensible because this is something that is likely to change over time. The requirements are likely to change. And so uh, making sure that the team that develops the tool that we're going to use is open to working with us, either adding features or letting us add features or having some other mechanism to extend was really important. Um, and that interaction was fantastic and has continued to be so I think we're we're really in a strong position there for being able to extend REMS as we need to. Um, and then the uh, last piece here was assessing REMS against our requirements using the test scenarios, which is something that we did um, in, in teams um, and, and found that it really did meet our needs with just a, a small number of tweaks needed. So I'm not gonna go through this slide in detail, but I wanted you to see the sorts of things that we mapped out in terms of the user stories and the different types of users. And I've already alluded to them in the previous slide, but this is just one set. And, and the, the take home here is that it's complicated and there are a lot of different connections and interactions. And so you can see why firstly, a tool like this, the devil's in the detail and also why we need it. Just relying on email or calling people is not going to work. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is take you through a case study, which is the Garvin use of REMS. So we've been using REMS for a few years now to manage some of the high value data sets um, at, that are hosted at Garvin. And really wanted to take it from this chaos of email. Um, and actually it wasn't even just email, there are printed records where people submitted printed ethics applications um, for consideration. And that makes it very difficult to track in the long term. And we are now at this stage on the right, which is a pretty nice interface, an instance of REMS that helps us with all of this management and the back and forth. So just to take you through a little bit more detail of what this looks like, we this is a, a zoomed in view of our catalogue. Um, we've got a, a small number of data sets, including our test, which is quite useful here for um, 
trying things out. Um, and, and this is the view that one of the administrators has. And so you can have a look and drill down in more detail to any of these catalog items. You can make changes. Um, and then there are other options to disable or archive. So it's a really easy way to quickly see what are all the data assets and then go from there. When we dig in more detail to a catalog item, there are a bunch of fields that make it quite easy to track versions and, and um, information about when data was put uh, on the site. And, um, and then uh, that's quite helpful for uh, all sorts of, of paper trail. Um, people often come to us and, and want to ask questions about particular catalog item, particular data set. And this is how we can start to dig in and answer those questions. Once you are an administrator, um, there's a whole set of different actions that people need to be able to take. So typically a, a requester comes in and puts in a submission and then you need to have some way of communicating with the data access committee to say, okay, this person's asked to be able to access this data set um, and here's their evidence and of, of ethics and what they want to do and to they ha they ha a decision has to be made. And so there's a, a portal that makes it easy for uh, the data managers who sit between the requester and the, the access committee uh, to, to manage those submissions. And I, I've blanked out some of the personal information, but you can see that the people are accessing, uh, requesting access to these resources. And then we have information about the applicant and also what's needed um, in terms of the next actions. So it's a, it's a clean interface that makes it easy for our data managers to track everything and know where submissions uh, requesting access to data are up to. And we also can then look at the um, applications that have been processed. This is just one view. I'm not going to take you through a whole lot more detail, but it shows you that it's, it's very easy to get a quick list, which is very important. Um, often we get requests for information about oh, where's it, where applications up to or who are the people that have submitted applications and what was the status. And so it, it is so much easier than searching through uh, hundreds of emails, which is really helpful. Okay, I'm going to finish now just with telling you about three areas that we are looking to um, expand this in the future. The first one is in reporting. So there is some reporting available and there's an API um, that lets you uh, interact with REMS programmatically, which is was great. Um, but there's, there are some specific reporting requirements that we identified that some of our users need that is not yet available. So we've been in discussion with the REMS team and they're quite open to adding that, um, which is great. So I, I, that's an ongoing conversation. Second area is um, ha what happens once you approve an application? Um, and this is an open question that it, we are tackling now in a separate project with Andrew Patterson and Oliver Hoffman, um, which is at the moment REMS has that has this niche that it sits in this, this particular spot where you can get approval to access data, but it doesn't actually grant you access. It doesn't flip a switch that then um, gives you access to the data itself. And so there's still a bit of an email trail to make that happen. And so we'd like to see that, that loop closed. And so that's another project ongoing. Um, and then the last piece is REMS as a service. So while it is pretty easy to stand up REMS uh, for your own instance at your institute and, and be able to run this yourself, we also know that some uh, institutes are not going to want to do that um, and perhaps only have one or two data sets. And so one of the things we're looking at is what's a good model for us or others to offer um, a REMS instance as a service and that then people can tap into that. Um, either with their own administrators having their own views like I showed you or having a team at, at, um, at somewhere else doing that uh, data management piece. So that's all about data access committees. Thank you. We'd just like to wrap up by acknowledging our uh, funders and partners engaged in the HGPP, all of whom are shown on, on this slide here and also encourage everybody should they want more information. Uh, there are some QR codes there that will take you to many of the outputs that we have discussed today. And you can also contact us 
uh, at the Biocommons at the email address contact at biocommons.org.au. We can also put you in touch with some of the other presenters, um, or of course you can reach out to them directly. And if you have any questions that you'd like to put to the team now, I think we have some time for Q&A. Firstly, thank you to Jess, Andrew, Mustafa and uh, Sarah for sharing those insights into how you're tackling this problem of access management of genomics data in this project. I'm going to start with a question for Sarah uh, about the REM system that you've set up. And it's a kind of a simple question is, has it actually saved you time? And if so, how much time has it saved you? It, it has saved a lot of time and it's something that's a little hard to estimate exact number because it's over the long term. So one of the things that's been most painful is when we go back to our paper record period of data um, access management, uh, people will say to us, okay, can you tell me all of the people who've um, been granted access to this data set? And that request might come through now for people who submitted five years ago. So it's it's an ongoing time saving, but in the short term, you know, it, it's gone from being a couple of hours of back and forth and looking at, 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 at data and making sure it's correct and then sending it back and then requesting more and just back and forth emails down to five minutes here and there just to check things and, and give it the okay. So it's a bit of a vague answer, but it's, it's, it's hours of, of time per application saved. Yes, and I imagine there's, you know, it's not like one or two applications, there's potentially hundreds of those, so potentially many hundreds of hours of work saved. So uh, a question I have, I think, for everybody is, um, you mentioned some opportunities, but what is next for the project? What are your, what are the next things you're going to be tackling? Well, I, I'm happy to jump in first. So I think one of the things is connectedness. So we, we've mentioned, I mean, you saw the diagram shows the connections between all of these components and we've started to build those, but there's, there's further to go. So I think we need to make sure we've solved small pieces of the puzzle and the next stage is to make it all work together. I agree with Sarah. Uh, there is a lot of uh, next phases more on integration, integrating all those space, pieces together. Uh, uh, although like there are a lot of improvements uh, that we are planning for the user interface. Uh, so user interface is going to give you just a, a set of a data set that you need to get a request that you, for which you need to create a data access request. So it has to be seamless. You don't need to jump from one system to another system. If we can make it seamless, uh, uh, like if a user can request a data access from the same interface, without feeling uh, like it's jumping, he has to jump to another interface. And then also downloading data, uh, especially the large data files. Uh, so connecting all these systems together, pieces of puzzles together is the next big phase for this. Um, I can add and field the question that's also appeared, which is I think for the identity management stream, obviously, um, the broad broadening the reach of, of CI logon and AAF to as many um, institutes. I mean, the coverage over the higher educational sector is, is almost complete, I believe. Um, but uh, medical research institutes, uh, you know, uh, Garvin is a member and, and New South Wales Health is a member and some of the places, but it, that's certainly not complete. And uh, the penetration into the clinical space is also extremely limited. Um, so that would be something. So the question was, how can organizations be incorporated into CI login? So I don't know whether that means incorporated into the general login mechanism or CI login specifically. So AAF, the Australian Access Federation, is the is the body that that handles all of this in, in Australia. They are the ones who are going to be running CI login on behalf of Australia. And they are the, the entity that um, connects you up. When the University of Melbourne wants to have its logins connected, that you need to speak to AAF. So um, reach out, or, I mean, yeah, just basically re reach out to AAF or reach out to AAF through us and, and we can put in contact. If, it, if you're already a member of AAF uh, and want to specifically be in, in co-manage or CI logon, uh, again, sp speak to AAF, but that would be a sim simpler, simpler path because they, they can just issue some logins and we can have a chat about that. Okay, thanks everybody.
we are going to have to leave it there for today. So firstly, I would again like to thank all of our speakers for coming along and sharing their time with us. As we leave, I also have a couple more things to share with everybody. If you, So next month, some of the Biocommons team will be down at in Melbourne for the International Congress of Genetics. So if you happen to be at that conference, do come along and say hi, and we could talk to you a little bit more about the projects we're doing with human genomics, but also in some other areas as well. This webinar is part of a series of training events that we run, and you can find out more about all of the different events that we have coming up on the BioCommons website, which you can see there on your screen. So once again, thank you to our speakers for sharing their time with us today, and thank you to all of you for joining us as well. The Australian BioCommons is enabled by ANCRIS via BioPlatforms Australia funding. Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoyed the webinar and we hope to see you again soon. But until then, goodbye for now and enjoy the rest of your day.